Holy Baptism by Water and the Spirit Video 2 of 11 Chapter 1 Our Amnesia and God's Story We are forgetful people. As our lifestyles become more hectic and society is driven by workaholics, we become more aware of our inability to remember everything. Without our electric devices reminding us of important events and meetings and deadlines, without our well-worn calendars and phone notifications, we fear we would be in a bigger mess. Our minds are so overwhelmed and full of things to remember. We fear we are going to forget something. Luckily for us, science and technology continue to improve ways to help us with our memory problems and try to help us get a handle on our complex lives. But we also have another kind of forgetfulness. It's forgetfulness of the spirit. Perhaps it is like spiritual amnesia. Amnesia is a form of memory loss. Whether you know it or not, both in our minds and deep in our hearts, there are many times we forget about God. How many times throughout our day do we really think about God? We forget what God has done for us and what God wants of us. We forget because we are not trained on how to remember God or see God and because we do not always pay attention even when we are taught. We forget because our busy lives distract us and we overlook the things we cannot see with our own eyes. We are seriously unaware of our own true identity, the identity given to us by our Creator. Who are we? To whom do we belong? Here's the Christian answer. We have been created to be close with God, but we have become blinded to this identity. We forget because life overwhelms us. This is our problem. Fortunately, God is aware of our problem and sees this as our sickness. God knows we cannot cure the sickness on our own. Our spiritual memory loss is beyond our help. Often we are not even aware that we are soul sick. It is this sickness, this forgetfulness, that we call sin. We are all infected with it, each and every one of us, without exception. So what's the cure? God knows the cure for us. God very much wants to heal us. God wants to heal us by reminding us of our true identity. Please pause the video to reflect on question number five. Sin, forgetfulness, sickness, whatever we call it, God offers many ways to help us. One way is by baptism. Baptism is like God sending us constant notifications on our cell phones. But our spirits are so hard of hearing and our minds so distracted that we can also misunderstand baptism and not know how it can really benefit us. We don't know how to listen well for the sounds of the living water that flows from it. You see, God plays a bigger part in baptism than we hardly ever see or understand. We tend to see baptism as a purely human action only. We misunderstand what God is doing through all of this, and we end up making baptism simply a symbol of our dedication to God, a sign of our faith to God. Baptism is so much more than that. A piece of paper. It has two sides. A FaceTime call. It involves two ends. A contract being signed. It has two parties involved, two signatures. Baptism also has two sides, too. Our side and God's side. 
Our biggest problem is trying to understand God's side of baptism. This is where we shall begin, on God's side, to see what God is doing in baptism for us. What God is doing is best told as a story, a story told by God, the story within our Bibles. This story can be summarized by five C words. Creation, Covenant, Christ, Church, and Coming Kingdom. The Story of God. You may pause this video to reflect more on question six. The Story of God, Part 1, Creation. Genesis is the first book of the Bible and includes tales of God creating the world. Baptism isn't mentioned in this part of the Bible, but look how baptism can remind us of these stories. It is here that the Spirit is hovering over the chaotic waters, dividing and restraining them on the first day of creation so that dry land could appear. It is here that the rivers flow through the Garden of Eden. It is here that the flood during Noah's days with chaotic waters returning to recreate a new world. In these accounts of creation in the opening chapters of the Bible, we discover two very important truths. God is very active in our world, and we are creatures made in the image of God and made to be responsible people. In the story where Adam and Eve are banished from the garden because of their sinning, it's like God is holding a mirror in front of all humankind so that we can see for ourselves who we really are, rebellious creatures who are still loved and protected by the Creator. These opening stories teach us about the complexity of our human problem, and they teach us this truth. We can be truly free only by rejecting a life of self-interest, self-centeredness, self-absorbedness. Real freedom comes only by being willingly obedient to God. However, outwardly, this appears to promise nothing more than slavery and death. In the story of Noah and the Great Flood, we see God continuing to show us the harm we bring on ourselves as well as the life God wants us to have. Notice how the same water that destroys the sinful world also raises the ark safely and sets it back down again in safety so that righteousness may flourish again. These early stories of Genesis set the major themes of the whole story of the Bible. We are judged by God and yet still saved by God. This is how baptism links us to the message of these opening stories of the Bible. You may pause this video to reflect longer on question 7. The Story of God, Part 2, Covenant God also helps us know our identity by presenting us with covenants. A covenant is an agreement between two or more persons promising to do or not do something specific. A covenant from God, far from being dull and legalistic, begins a relationship between one who makes a promise, the promiser, and those to whom the promise is given, the promisees. Through the waters of baptism, we are connected to the covenant God made with Noah after the flood. Behold, I establish my covenant with you and your descendants after you and with every living creature that is with you, that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of a flood. Genesis 9, chapters 8 through 11. Many of the covenants God makes to us in the Bible involves water, the crossing of the Red Sea, the cloud that guided the people, the water that was brought forth from the rock in the wilderness, the bitter waters of Merah and the sweet springs of Elim, and the crossing of the Jordan into the land of promise.
Centuries later, Jesus' disciple Peter recognized how these ancient stories point us to baptism, found in 1 Peter chapter 3, 18 through 22. Baptism is like a passing through the waters of bondage and death, much like the Israelites passed through the Red Sea. During this story, the Israelites were led to safety away from the captivity of the Egyptian pharaoh. Baptism for us means a release from captivity, spiritual, physical, and mental. This is what God promises to do for us today. Notice how each of the covenants come with a sign. For Noah, the rainbow was the sign of God's covenant with him. For the Passover, the lamb was the sign of God's covenant with Israel. For us, water is the sign to help us remember these ancient promises and to remind us of our identity as a people with significant responsibilities here on earth. Covenants always imply responsibility and expectations, to do or not do something specific. Like a contract, a covenant outlines the benefits alongside the responsibilities. Please pause the video to reflect longer on question 8. The Story of God, Part 3, Christ the life and ministry of Jesus was also soaked in water. Before he was born at Christmas, he was nurtured in the water of Mary's womb. Later, he was baptized in the Jordan River. At the end of his earthly life, he cried out in thirst from the cross, and a spear poked his side, emptying him of blood and water. Jesus' ministry began around the Sea of Galilee, where he called forth fishermen, as they mended their fishing nets to be his followers. And on that sea, he walked upon the water and stilled the storm. Using lots of images of water in his preaching, Jesus spoke of the God who sends rain on the good and the bad equally, how weather can be a sign from God, and the power that occurs when a cup of cold water is given in his name. Particularly in the Gospel of John, Water saturates our stories of Jesus. Jesus' first miracle is that of turning water into wine. At Jacob's well, Jesus meets the Samaritan woman and tells her that he himself is the water of life. In Jerusalem, Jesus heals a paralyzed man at the sight of a pool. He restores sight to the man born blind by making clay with saliva, and then sends the man to bathe in the pool of Siloam. Jesus washes the feet of his followers before his final suffering, and after his resurrection, he grants a marvelous catch of fish to his disciples. Nothing in God's good creation has the power to remind us so perfectly of the work of God than the common, everyday water. This is what is given to us through baptism so that from the moment of baptism onward, we may be reminded of all God has done for us and taught us, that we may see ourselves as a people united to God and to one another. The Story of God, Part 4, Church The church is owned by Jesus. Jesus is the cornerstone of his church. People like us are the bricks. The Holy Spirit is like the mortar that binds us all together. Christ is the cornerstone, or capstone, the head. People, the bricks. Holy Spirit, the mortar. But the church is not just a building. The real church is the community of believers itself. It's like that community or congregation is a family. It's Jesus' family. Sons and daughters of God, brothers and sisters to Jesus. Baptism is like our adoption into this new family. We shouldn't forget about all those who have raised us from birth. Our household family is still our real family. 
but the church is a family too. A family not of blood relations, uncles, cousins, parents, etc., but by the work of the Holy Spirit. God's covenant and baptism makes this possible. At this point, we often focus on church membership, as if that's the ultimate sign that we are truly accepted into the church. Membership is closely related to baptism, but it is not the same thing as baptism. If we focus too much on membership, we will be concerned only about how the church can benefit us, and less about our duties as disciples of Christ. Baptism is about the spiritual bond that happens between each Christian inside the church community. Baptism is not just a thing between you and God alone. Baptism points to our shared commitment to each other in the church. Baptism is meant to benefit the whole group, not just the individuals. All those who profess membership in any church must be baptized first. Of course, we may quickly find that not all those baptized and profess membership will live into it actively. Many people today are considered inactive. So a baptismal community is a group effort. And whenever it fails to nurture and keep its members active and vital, that's a fault we must also share. Baptism is unique to the church. No other organization or society on earth practices baptism. In fact, truth be told, it is not we who baptize. Only Christ baptizes. It is Christ's own family, and it is only Christ who can initiate us into his own family. Baptism is God working inside us. Therefore, neither you nor the pastor are the main actors in baptism. God is. Did you know that our place in God's family is also permanent? Yes. That means baptism is significant to you long after you have been dashed with that water. Trouble arises, though, when we forget that baptism is ultimately about who we are together as a church. When that happens, We are simply okay with church being just another human organization to choose from. But when church people remember that baptism is our watery ties that bind ourselves together, hand to hand, heart to heart, across the whole world, we become the powerful force we are meant to be in the world. Baptism, therefore, is part of each person's purpose to be a part of God's ongoing work in the world to be a part of that group of people through whom God does that work. The Story of God, Part 5, Coming Kingdom The kingdom of God, or the kingdom of heaven, is not just a future thing. It has already come into our midst now. This is because of Jesus Christ. This kingdom is the ultimate goal of the church. It's the ultimate will of God. The church, in a regrettably imperfect way, is where the kingdom reveals itself to the world. Church has become Christ's primary way of doing God's will in the world. And yet, not all of it happens within the four walls of individual church buildings. Remember, the church is not a building. The church is the people. Jesus instructed us to wait excitedly and expectantly for the kingdom to arrive in its fullness. In the Lord's Prayer, Jesus taught us to pray continually for his kingdom to come. Our problem is this. As we wait, all the anxieties of our lives will blur and fog up our vision of that good and better future. This is precisely when we are most prone to forget the hope that is written throughout our Holy Bible. We forget because of all the awful things we see in the world. These awful things are so often overemphasized and perpetuated by our daily news feeds. 
we forget so easily that our God still has ultimate control over all things. We forget that the kingdom has already arrived. Yes, already arrived. The fullness of the kingdom here on earth is limited only when the church neglects to see the kingdom around them and within them. Who holds the future? As you can see, baptism can be a sign of a good and better future. Baptism is something given to the church by Christ to remind us that all is still under his control and all will be fully revealed at the end. In the end, God wins. Goodness triumphs. Even though we've been talking so much about stuff in the Bible, notice how baptism points to the future even more than to the past. All that God has done in creation, in covenant making, in the coming of Christ, and in the establishment of the church by the power of the Holy Spirit, God has promised will all press on toward the coming kingdom. The kingdom of God is the final fulfillment of all human history under God. As we begin to just scratch the surface of baptism, let us summarize before moving on. Baptism is a gift from Christ meant to overcome our tendency to forget the hope we have in Him and in His final triumph over sin and death. This hope is made possible because baptism is all about pointing us to our true identity, who we really are. When we ask, who holds the future? Who has the final word? Baptism gives us the answer. The one who gives us baptism is the one who promises us a good and better future. Baptism in the Meaning of God's Story Remember that the Bible, God's story for us, can be summarized under five headings. Creation, Covenant, Christ, Church, and Coming Kingdom. This story, from Genesis to Revelation and beyond, is all about us figuring out who we are and to whom we belong. It's about our identity. The story is building. It may seem like Christianity is all about old stories stuck 2,000 years or more in the past. We sometimes feel so far removed from these stories of the Bible, it feels like the story of God is done and over. It has little or no importance for us today. Friends, the story of God, the story of the Bible, continues to be written today. And we are included in that story. Baptism is our entry into that story. We are the people who keep that story alive, not just by retelling it, but by reliving it in our daily lives and in our witness to the world. We are God's storytellers. Here is how God is helping us write that story. God's story is moving from creation to consummation. Construction to completion. Conception to conclusion. God's story is all about progress and expansion. We are not just merely expecting a recovery of some original plan or a returning to some quaint past. In the beginning, there existed nothing but chaos. This chaos God contained within the seas. Genesis 1 verses 9 through 10. At the end, as the Bible tells it, even the sea is destroyed. Revelation 21, verse 1. In the beginning, God created light from the moon and sun. Genesis chapter 1, verse 3, verses 14 through 15. At the completion, there will be no sun or moon, for God's very glory is the light. Revelation 22. At the start, there existed a garden for two people, Genesis chapter 2. 
At the conclusion, there is a city that can contain the entire people of God. Revelation 21. God is telling us that history is headed somewhere. We are not wandering aimlessly. We are moving from one to the other. God has a purpose for us all, and God is pursuing it without stopping. One day that purpose will be accomplished. It will be accomplished because people like you allow God to use you to accomplish it. This is our baptismal assurance. This is our baptismal duty. It reminds us that we have hope and life. It reminds us that we have important work to do. Please answer questions 14 and 15 before reading chapter 2 or watching video number 3.